Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza are living under the never-ending threat of famine because of the shortage of humanitarian aid. Is the starvation of civilians being used by Israel as a weapon of war? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I am Hashim Ahlbarra. The United Nations is warning that hundreds of thousands of people in Gaza are on the brink of starvation. Acute levels of hunger are facing around 2 million Palestinians after many of them lost their homes and livelihoods. Desperate people unable to feed themselves or their children are living in family-like conditions, some resorting to eating animal feed and weeds to survive. Is a strangling of food, medicine and other humanitarian supplies being used as a weapon of war by the Israeli government? We'll be discussing all this and more with our guests shortly. But first, Mali Khabi Motsepe reports on the widespread suffering with no end in sight. Surrounded by the ruins of what used to be their homes, Om Jamil is among the estimated 300,000 Palestinians who stayed in the isolated area of northern Gaza. People there have not been receiving deliveries of food because international aid trucks are being denied access to the areas in need. Some residents in Jabalia say they have faced prolonged periods without food or access to water. To survive, they've resorted to picking weeds to cook for their children and turning animal feed into flour. As you can see, our conditions are difficult. Everything is closed here and there is danger all around us when collecting the weeds. But we have no other choice but to ensure that the children receive food in any way possible so they don't have to endure hunger. We come to this mill to grind barley and corn and everything that can be ground, even animal feed. We are forced to eat everything because of hunger. We ask the Arab countries and all other countries of the world to secure the entry of aid to our people who have no help. As you can see, this is animal fodder. An estimated 580,000 Palestinians in Gaza are facing catastrophic levels of hunger. The World Food Programme is warning that there's acute shortages in northern Gaza. But unless we get significant volumes on a regular basis to people in the most food insecure areas of Gaza, that we would have famine conditions in place by May or June of this year. We are not getting significant amounts of aid in. We are not doing it every day as we need to do. Since the start of Israel's war, convoys of humanitarian aid have been delayed, denied permits and sometimes attacked. Israeli soldiers screen everything and seize items deemed useful to Hamas. More recently, a group of Israeli protesters demanding the release of captives set up barbed wire at the Karim Shalom border crossing to stop trucks entering Gaza. I cannot understand why a country at war is bringing humanitarian aid into its over enemy lines um, and fueling the war. Every truck that goes in is another day of war for both sides. Israel's bombardment of southern Gaza is forcing more than two million displaced people to head back north in search of shelter, pressuring many into making a choice of potentially dying from hunger in the north or being killed by Israeli bombing in the south. Malachi Bamadzebe, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Hani Mahmoud sent us this report from Rafah, where many Palestinians are struggling to secure food. Since the beginning of this genocidal war on Gaza, living conditions have become increasingly difficult for people here, overcrowded Rafah, uh, where there is a real struggle for food and water and almost a famine taking place in the northern part of Gaza. This is the daily normal defined by displacement, terror and hunger, where the vast majority of displaced families forced out of their homes from the north and more recently from the central area and the city of Khan Yunis are now hungry with little financial capabilities as depletion of basic necessities and food supplies, an ongoing blockade on humanitarian aid causing prices to double and triple for some goods. The unusual scene of people queuing in line, in line for a ball of soup 
uh, it just become uh, or has become the uh, major feature of people living in Rafah city since the beginning of the war. Hani Mahmoud for the inside story Al Jazeera in southern Gaza. Let's bring in our guests in our studio in London. Omar Abdelmanan is a pediatric neurologist who co-founded the Doctors' Help group called Health Workers of Palestine. From Rafah in Gaza, Fidel Araj is a food security and livelihood coordinator at Oxfam, also in London. Donatella Rovera is senior crisis response advisor at Amnesty International. Welcome to the program. Let me start with Fida. You are in Rafah where people are struggling on a daily basis to secure food for themselves, for their loved ones, for their children. Give us a sense of what is happening, particularly in the central and northern part of Gaza, where many say that's where we have the biggest humanitarian crisis. Actually, um, as you said, it's not only about Rafah, it's uh, all across Gaza Strip. Uh, you have the whole population of over 2 million people at imminent risk of famine. Uh, the numbers say that more than 370,000 uh, of these people are at uh, the huge risk, uh, immediate risk of starvation, with exhaustive, uh, where they have exhausted their coping mechanisms also. So they are about to die from hunger. Uh, this is how it looks like in Gaza now, more specifically in the north and the center parts of Gaza, with a, a huge uh, no access of food aid or any food items uh, to that to those parts people are suffering they are looking for essential goods for any part, a kind of food commodities with no luck to find them at all uh, here in rafah uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the situation is worsening as well uh, with the cut of the entering of uh, the aid trucks and with the scarcity of the food uh, commodities to start with before all of this even started Donatella, what, what is the biggest obstacle to the steady flow of aid into Gaza? Is it logistical? Is it the long security screening of the material? Or is it simply a politically motivated thing? It is beyond doubt that um, there is a lack of political will. Uh, obviously, from the Israeli authorities, they are the occupying power and they are the ones who control access to the Gaza Strip. And they are the ones that have been restricting the entry of both humanitarian aid and commercial imports, not just from the 7th of October, but um, for the past 16 years. Um, that is in itself a breach of international humanitarian law. Um, Israel has not been complying with its obligation. Mm -hmm. Just to be very, very clear, uh, mm -hmm. if there is a need for humanitarian aid in Gaza, is because Israel, as the occupying power, has not been fulfilling its obligation. Um, it's not the duty of the international community to provide food, water, medical care, education, all that the population under occupation needs. Mm -hmm. That is the duty and the obligation of the occupying power. Not only Israel has not been doing that, but it has constantly restricted the entry of humanitarian aid, of imports, of medicines, of, of absolutely everything that the civilian population requires um, for you know, the essential needs of daily life. Now, since the 7th of October, mm -hmm. that level of restriction has increased exponentially. And in addition, the wholesale destruction, including the deliberate destructions of road, uh, wanton destruction not required by military necessity, uh, that kind of distraction is also creating logistical problem because especially now that people are escaping uh, Rafa and moving towards the middle area of Gaza, hoping to find safety, even mm. though, you know, that's obviously not uh, not going, you know, that does not look possible at the moment. But that means that people are going to an area where there is nothing and where getting the aid from the southern border uh, of Gaza to those areas is going to be even more difficult because of the state of the roads as a result of the Israeli military operation. Okay, so, 
Okay. Omar, you, you, you must be in touch with uh, medics uh, on the ground. How are children coping with this horrible situation unfolding in Gaza? Thank you, Hashim. I think the reality is uh, no one is coping with the situation in Gaza because, as we have seen time and time again, the Israeli occupation forces determined to bomb and target hospitals and healthcare facilities. What that means is the acute starvation that many of these children are being exposed to. And let us not forget there are cases of marasmus and quashial core coming into hospitals in Gaza, which is the uh, immediate effects of acute malnutrition, things that we saw in Somaliland or Somalia in the 90s, but we are now seeing in Gaza in 2024. On top of that, you have targeting healthcare facilities, which means these same children that are starving and are uh, you know, at risk of uh, long-term negative health sequelae are not able to gain access to care, to re-nutrition, to the right um, you know, treatment for that. And you know, only yesterday I was talking to colleagues within the Nasser Medical Hosp Hospital Complex, and we saw children being shot at, killed, by snipers inside the hospitals from Israeli drones and quadrupters with machine guns on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the reality is it's all well and good talking about malnutrition and lack of aid, but the real root cause is currently that there is an ongoing bombing, bombardment, uh, continual attacks on hospitals, destroying and decimating any sort of healthcare facility that could actually salvage some of these children. And this is 100% man-made. This is created by the Israeli state, by the Israeli occupation forces, and it's been compounded by the Egyptians mm -hmm. not allowing aid in as well and closing up the borders at Rafah. We have to remember that this is multi-pronged. There are numerous agents at play here. And whilst the Israelis are the perpetrators, they are being egged on by the UK, the US, and some of the Arab countries, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Fida, if you were to give us a list of the top priorities for the people of Gaza in terms of humanitarian aid. What would be the main material that you would like to see coming to Gaza now? Um, actually, it's, um, it's a lot, it's a package of priorities, let's say, because after all of this time of um, stopping all kinds of aid to enter, then the priorities are accumulating, if you want. But the first and foremost priority is food. People need to eat, people need to drink, people need to eat something beyond the canned food that's trickling in through the aid trucks. People need fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, um, eggs, poultry, things that um, have a nutritional um, uh, a nutritional value to it, not just to uh, stave their hunger. So the, the quality of the food to enter Gaza is an essential. Uh, and of course, the priority is of more and more and more quantities of food to enter mm -hmm. Gaza because the need is huge and the need is unmet and for people on the verge of starvation, of a famine. So it's very essential how much food enters, not only what food there does enter. Uh, plus, there is a need for clean drinking water for uh, medication, if you want, because of mm -hmm. the nutrition um, um, problems caused by the lack of food. We face uh, so many diseases, so many health uh, complications that need treatment as well. They will not be treated by food entry alone. So mm -hmm. uh, this and uh, combined with the fuel, uh, the cooking gas, um, equipment to be used also to cook the food because when you look on the ground, uh, you don't find anything you know, like there is no setup or there is a very, we are reduced to a very primitive setup of making food actually. So it's not enough to get um, the materials or the ingredients to make a meal. It's important to provide everything that you need to make an actual meal and put it uh, in front of a family or a starving kid. Donatella, human rights groups have been accusing Israel of using starvation as a method of war. What can be done now in terms of international humanitarian law to stop this practice from continuing for the upcoming days and weeks? Um, I mean, the legal tools are there. Um, Israel's obligations uh, are absolutely clear. 
what is required is political will at the level of the international community. First of all, for, for those countries, and, and United States is obviously the key one, but there are others too, uh, that are providing weapons to Israel um, that allow the continuous bombardment of civilians and civilian infrastructures, the weapons that are fueling the conflict. So, you know, those weapon imports should be stopped at once because there is ample evidence that they're being used in a manner that contravenes international humanitarian law. Secondly, again, the those that are that have the influence on uh, on the Israeli authorities need to put pressure to force Israel to comply with its obligation to allow both humanitarian aid mm. and uh, imports into Gaza to stop targeting food production um, um, places such as uh, uh, fields where uh, food is being grown, factories where food is being processed, uh, uh, bakeries, all the civilian infrastructure that has been a target uh, from day one, from the 7th of October, but also from long before. Uh, mm -hmm. The population of Gaza was already in a, in a very, very dire humanitarian situation before the 7th of October. And so the rate at which the situation has deteriorated is all the greater. And there is only uh, one thing, you know, there is only mm -hmm. really one side that can change this equation. And that is for Israel to be forced to comply with its obligation uh, by its international allies that are providing it with um, economic, military, and political support, because clearly the Israeli mm -hmm. authorities have shown that they are not um, complying with international law and that they are violating international law on a daily basis. Omar, you touched on the children malnutrition. We're talking about more than a million people are stuck or stranded in the southern part of the uh, of Rafah, living in uh, tents with the risk of more disease spreading. Do you have any concerns that if there's no intervention in the upcoming days, the situation could just further degenerate and become and spin out of control? Absolutely. Like I said, we are seeing already the acute effects of uh, malnutrition of children having to eat animal feed in the north and middle of Gaza. Um, this is, you know, these are deplorable conditions, but they have been, uh, you know, created by the Israeli state. Now, the other thing to note, and this is a really important point, People do not die from starvation instantly. People, when they are starved and stressed at long periods of time, especially children under the age mm -hmm. of two, um, they end up having essentially immunocompromised. Their immune system is compromised. They are at much greater risk of dying from diarrheal illnesses like cholera, which for sure is spreading in Gaza, even if we cannot test for it. Uh, they die from hepatitis. They die from pneumonia or chest infections is simple illnesses that should be preventable and should not lead to death become lethal in these conditions. So the excess mortality rates, which I suspect will number in the hundreds of thousands when the dust settles, if the dust settles, then I think this is where my, gra my gravest concern as a pediatrician is. And also it's important to know any child who under the age of two goes through this period of acute malnutrition, whether it's as a fetus or as a child, they are essentially limited in terms of their long-term health outcomes. These children will have lasting final impacts on their cardiovascular health, on their risk of cancer, on their risk of, you know, their ability to grow. This mm -hmm. is a lost generation of wounded children with no surviving family and children that have been stunted, that have been malnutritioned, that have been cognitively uh, destroyed, essentially, by the Israeli war machine. Fida, uh, Aid agencies are basically saying that there's been no trucks into Gaza uh, for uh, for about a week, and that even during the, uh, the the deal between Hamas and Israel, 95 trucks were allowed. When in normal times, particularly before the war, you, 500 commercial and aid trucks were allowed into the Strip to deal with the needs of the people. Give us a sense of what are the local and international aid agencies doing now when basically they have nothing to offer to the hundreds of thousands of people who are so desperate and anxious about what happens tomorrow. 
actually um, what we're trying to do as humanitarian workers is, um, is limited. Uh, because all of our um, uh, aid is coming from outside of Gaza. Uh, what we're trying to do is to get, basically, uh, the most important thing for us is to try to get uh, what we have in the Egyptian side into Gaza, to be able to organize distributions to people, to be able to serve the people that we work with and that, that as you said, are desperate for support and for help. Uh, what we're trying to do collectively is uh, try to coordinate whatever um, small means uh, we have from uh, previous uh, aid entries into Gaza and uh, to be able to reach as much as possible. But I can frankly tell you it's nowhere, nowhere near enough. Um, we need an essential um, a root uh, solution, if you want, for all of this. Uh, there is a huge need uh, for immediate release of uh, the mm -hmm. aid uh, stuck into the Egyptian border. And before that, and most important, more important than that, there is a huge need to cease fire, to stop all of that, so that we can reach people that we are uh, unable to reach, whether they are in the north of Gaza, in the Gaza city, or in the border areas. Um, there is a need also to be able to mobilize the local market or the local production of food, because that also is a resource that that's completely cut since day one of the war. Farmers aren't able to reach their lands, aren't able to cultivate. There is no enough water. There is no enough fuel to um, to operate the bombs and uh, the equipment they need for the agriculture. So all of the local food production is almost um, reduced to zero so mm -hmm. there is a need to support that and of course we are trying to raise our voices we are trying to collectively tell the stories of the starving people it's not um, a completely humanitarian story it's a humanitarian result of a bigger um, war that's raging against the people of Gaza. People are being killed by so many means, one of which is the starvation of people. It's, oh. been used, it's, it's, it's been used as a weapon of war since the start, and it only continues so. Donatella, the Israeli government has a unit, the Kogat, which liaises with the United Nations when it comes to the uh, aid. And they say that basically they're not blocking aid, but they're making sure that the aid is not going to go end up being in the hands of uh, Hamas, and that they also would like to ensure that the dual usage material does not enter into Gaza. And can you believe it? Power generators, crutches, field hospital kits are considered dual usage material. Is this against the law? Uh, the prevention of entry into the occupied territory by the occupying power of the means for, for essential uh, requirements for the civilian population, uh, that is a breach of international humanitarian law. Uh, it's a war crime. As I said, it's not uh, only since the 7th of October that these restrictions have been imposed. They have been imposed continuously for the past 16 years, they have generally been increased at times when the violence and the confrontation has, has, uh, has increased. But does uh, restrictions, um, unwarranted, have been in place for 16 years? And that's why Gaza was already in a coma situation when the 7th of October um, situation changed with increased restrictions. Um, so Kogat knows perfectly well um, what it should and and should not be doing. Um, the requests have been ongoing. Um, the, the details about the terrible consequences for the civilian populations mm -hmm. um, are extremely uh, clear. So uh, water, uh, medicines, food uh, cannot be considered something that is, mm, that, you know, that can be with withheld from the civilian population. Um, Israel has the possibility to check everything that goes into Gaza. Um, it, it is what it has been doing. The fact okay. that it's just not allowing what is required is completely unacceptable. Uh, I have uh, many other issues to discuss with you, so I appreciate if you can give me some 
short answers, Omar, the health system has been completely decimated. When United Nations and international agencies are saying we need urgent action to deal with the health system, what do they mean by that? What they should be meaning is that there needs to be a ceasefire, an immediate and permanent ceasefire now mm -hmm. to allow hospitals and hospitals to be rebuilt, supplies to go back in, medical personnel to come in and help the exhausted medics who are being targeted, 400 of which have been, whom have been killed, and 100 are still in illegal detention and have been tortured when they've been uh, detained, uh, as, as you must be aware. So what they mean is that we need supplies, we need mm -hmm. uh, an end to the violence which is preventing these supplies from making it in. And I think Building on Donatella's point, it is crucial that to understand that the US and the UK are literally sending those arms that are bombing the hospitals. So they are complicit in this genocide. Okay. These are war crimes, and that complicity will come back to haunt them. Donatella, with the future of uh, UNRWA uncertain, what kind of impact, if it shuts doors in the future, what kind of impact would that have on the humanitarian aid operations in Gaza? Well, any withdrawal of services, um, help, uh, humanitarian aid, education to what is actually the majority of the population in the Gaza Strip would have absolutely disastrous consequences. Again, I go back to the point that ultimately um, Israel as the occupying power is legally required to provide all of those services. Israel has not been doing so. Um, the international community, mostly through UNRWA, but also through international aid organization has been doing that, uh, preventing, um, preventing that from, from uh, continuing to happen would have absolutely disastrous consequences um, on, the, on the population, adults and children especially, because as the point was made already, uh, children are being impacted uh, massively. Their, their future is being destroyed. The equivalent of um, 10 children a day uh, mm -hmm. have lost a limb. About 1,000 children have lost limbs since the beginning okay. of, the, um, of, of, of this crisis. So you can imagine, you know, what, Thank you. what the requirements are. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. Donatella Rivera, Omar Abdelmanan and Fidel Arzer, really appreciate your time and insight. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Ahalbawa, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.